Welcome again. Um, our next speaker is Stephen Waugh. Stephen is currently the Senior Environmental Officer in the Department of the Environment, Heritage and Climate Change and is actively involved in the management of Gibraltar's marine and terrestrial environment. He completed his first degree in environmental science at the University of Southampton and then obtained a master's degree in environmental management from Imperial College London. He is currently reading for a PhD in marine science at the University of Gibraltar's Institute of Life and Earth Sciences. Stephen. Thank you, Alex. That's the last slide, actually, not the first slide. <laughs> yeah. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I can skip all the way back, but I'll probably. Thanks. Well, I thought I had less time actually. Um, so my presentation should be about, about 40, 40 minutes. But anyway, I'm sure we can expand on, on some of the slides because to be honest with you, there's so much um, happening uh, in terms of monitoring in our waters that I, I, I found it difficult initially to think, well, what am I really gonna talk about? Shall I just focus on my PhD, which, which I'm sure um, merits one, two, and possibly three presentations, um, or shall I talk a, a bit about everything? And then I decided to go for that, uh, and in doing so, um, include some other of the, the co-authors um, that have helped me with, with the presentation. Okay, so when we talk about recent surveillance work that we're doing, I think, in my perspective, we need, I like to put things in, into perspective. Um, and sort of showcase um, how big our waters are um, and their relevance in, 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 in terms of the larger scale. Small inset there is, is, is British Gibraltar territorial waters. So in our case, as you're aware, not a really large amount of territorial waters, approximately three nautical miles on the east side and in the south and um, just under two nautical miles inside the bay. So a small amount of territorial waters, which means that in theory, when it comes to surveillance, it's relatively easier. It's certainly easier when compared to other overseas territories located, for example, in, in the mid-Atlantic, um, like Ascension Island, the Falklands, just under Cunha, Santelina. And these overseas territories are really having a, a hard time when it comes to, to surveillance monitoring. And I thought it, was, it would be nice to include this particular photo because it's taken from the International Space Station. Um, and as part of the UK's Blue Belt program, which is geared towards monitoring um, marine protected areas um, in the overseas territories, they're actually using satellite technology to monitor pressures and threats in the large expanses of, of um, marine protected areas, particularly in British Antarctic Territory, at the Falklands, those areas where it's really um, quite difficult to monitor. Um, and this has been in, in the spotlight recently, um, with, with, uh, particularly with one particular country uh, and, and large fishing fleets that have been tracked in the vicinity of the Galapagos, etc. It goes to show really that you know, um, we really need Big Brother watching you to be able to, to, to ascertain what is happening in, in the larger expanses in the, in the ocean environment. So in terms of of habitats found in our waters. Um, I think the first time that uh, uh, an attempt was made to, um, to classify uh, or characterize what, what is found in, in our marine protected area was done in 2006, when the Southern Waters of Gibraltar Special Area of Conservation, uh, stroke Special Protected Area, um, was initially designated. I think Clive mentioned before um, what is the criteria that is used when, when classifying marine protected areas. Well, unfortunately, at the moment, um, 
a lot of what we're seeing is that sites are actually classified based on representativity. In other words, what species are found in this particular area. Now, in my view, well, it's, it's not my view, it's, it's a generally established um, belief. There are other factors that need to be considered, not just migration, but also the element of connectivity as well. Um, it might be the case that you're protecting one particular area, but you should be looking at a network of smaller areas might be possibly more effective um, than just designating a large expanse of, of, of water. And I'll be talking a bit more about that in the context of the work that I'm currently doing as, as part of my PhD. I'll also like to take the opportunity to talk about um, the wider surveillance efforts that we're carrying out wearing my um, senior environment officer hat for, for the Department of Environment. So going back to the species that, uh, sorry, the habitats found in, in our waters. Initially, it was very generally characterized um, as reefs, submerged sea caves, or partially submerged sea caves. Um, but we really didn't drill down into those individual subclassifications. And that work is currently being down, done now um, in the context of updating our classification criteria for the southern waters. And some of the habitats that, that are coming up, which weren't sort of, strictly speaking, included in the initial designation, were, for example, deep seabed, which is uh, an ecosystem in itself, and I'll be talking a bit more about that later on in the presentation. Sublitoral sediment. That includes, for example, sand. Um, it's a habitat which is very regularly um, overseen by, uh, by, by, by scientists and, and by the public in general. You tend to think that they are impoverished areas of, of, of habitat, and that is certainly not the case. Um, Sandbanks on the eastern side of Gibraltar in particular are extremely rich, um, and we know that based on data from fisheries, actually. Um, because it's a point I, 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 I thought it was important to stress. We haven't really done any targeted surveys in terms of sandy habitats of Gibraltar, um, at least over a prolonged period. Most of the surveillance monitoring efforts that have been carried out today have tended to focus on pelagic species, and Clive gave an excellent talk now about seabirds, which are comparatively well studied, um, and also uh, reef habitats, particularly shallow water reef. Those two, uh, sorry, and littoral rock as well, the intertidal, which is arguably uh, the most well studied habitat in our waters, due to obvious reasons. It's very accessible, so it facilitates science, scientific research. Um, but having said that, there are other elements or other habitats in our, in our marine reserve that certainly merits closer consideration and more detailed survey. This is one particular, I know Clive mentioned photos are always good and they certainly help um, communicate um, the information. In this particular case, this is a sort of shallow um, circular habitat on the eastern side, um, known locally as a Cortijo Reef. Um, and it's also one of the more um, diverse areas on the east side. But there's more, and we'll be talking, I'll be talking a bit more about that as, as the presentation goes forward. Literal rock, <clears throat> as I mentioned before, or natural literal rock, should I say, I think it's important to make a, a distinction between the different types of, of, of intertidal habitats. Um, natural literal rock in Gibraltar, uh, is limited. At least, uh, at least literal rock with, with sort of gentle gradients, um, such as this particular photo over here, which is taken in, in Rosy Bay, which is actually one of the areas with the highest intertidal diversity in Gibraltar. Um, if you look at how our coastline or natural um, coastline has changed over the years, it's, it's quite impressive actually. And in terms of the the amount of coastline, it's practically doubled from 1943. So I'm not, I'm not sure whether I have a pointer here. No, we don't. We don't, okay. So, but you can more or less make out 
how our coastline has changed since 1943. Um, unfortunately, a lot of that change has been artificial structures which aren't necessarily good for, for different marine species. However, there are some habitats which are better suited for some species, such as artificial littoral rock or revetments, for example, particularly when a pet certain substrates are used, like limestone. So you're, in essence, recreating um, parts of the natural habitat which, which can be found. However, I say that, I say this particular um, sentence with caution because that need not mean that we now need to go out and, and build new revetments. But it's certainly something to consider um, when new developments are being built. And it is being considered um, as part of, of, of the planning process now, now in Gibraltar. This particular habitat type represents approximately 19% of our coastline at the moment, which is uh, double the amount of what you tend to find in Andalusia, which is approximately around 10% in the wider region. Why is it important? Well, this is one particular species that has taken a liking for artificial revetments in Gibraltar, the critically endangered Patella ferriginea. Um, I know Clive mentioned some species which, uh, in his view, are important, or the Straits of Gibraltar is important. I would also add this particular limpet to the list. Um, it might appear as, a, as an inconspicuous limpet, but there's certainly more to it than meets, than meets the eye. Um, for example, it changes sex from male to female and then back again, depending on environmental cues. So it might be the case that there's not enough males and it will change back, which I find fascinating. Um, it's also interesting to note that it can live over 30 years. Now, there hasn't been any sort of uh, long-term marking studies carried out in Gibraltar. There have been studies carried out in Ceuta, and that's, from, that's how this information has been obtained. I think the longest they've, they've managed to find uh, has been 35 years, around 35 years, which is, which is fascinating. And it's something I'll be looking at more closely as, as part of, of my PhD research. In other words, um, how long are the species or the specimens found in, in Gibraltar are lasting. Again, it's an important species also because of the fact that it's, it's critically endangered. Its distribution was much wider um, during the Paleolithic and Neolithic times. Um, it's been reducing progressively, most likely due to anthropogenic pressure, um, like bait collection, for example, even for food, which is something which is very common in the Canaries, for example. Fortunately, we're not seeing that um, in Gibraltar, but it is observed in the wider region, particularly on the Atlantic coast with other species of, of, of giant limpets. Um, and that might be one of the reasons why the population in Gibraltar is actually doing relatively well, if you ask me. These are some of the data that have been collected since, since 2010, really. I mean, that, that, I think we can present a better picture using the data collected in, in, in the Spanish mainland because it goes back for, for, for 10 years at least. And you can see here how the population has been steadily increasing over the last decade, including Gibraltar's um, population. When I say Gibraltar's population, I, I use the term loosely because the limpets that you find in a region are all part of the same population. So, I'll be a bit nationalistic for a second, or I'll call them the Gibraltar Olympics. Um, but certainly, there appears to be an increase over the past decade. And when you look at the numbers that you find in Gibraltar in comparison to the wider bay, you can see that our population is quite important. It comes in second to the the subpopulation found in Punta Sal Garcia in Algeciras, which is approximately 707 um, specimens. Um, the North Mole, for example, 
I've counted 590 there. Um, Gibraltar Airport, the joint survey carried out with, with Darren, 441, um, which goes to show that, you know, Gibraltar's um, population could be or is important um, in comparison to, to the wider region. How important is it is, is also another inter interesting question. And in order to answer that, you also need to look at the sizes of the specimens that are found in Gibraltar. Um, just because you have a high number of, or a good abundance of the species in Gibraltar need not necessarily mean um, that our population is, is a source population. You need to look at the sizes and see exactly how big they are. And what we're finding is, or what has been found, is that places like, for example, the Gibraltar Airport, the east side, the south mole, which have restricted access, will have a higher number of large specimens which <clears throat> have a high reproductive capacity. As part of the work I'm doing, um, the general cutoff is about seven centimeters. So anything, any lipids which is above that is considered a female. Having said that, there are specimens which are below seven centimeters, which might also be reproductive um, females. So as part of the work I'm doing, I'll be looking at some of the um, candidate source subpopulations and extracting, uh, using a syringe, uh, it's a non-lethal method, and depending on the color of the, the extracts, you're able to determine whether or not it's, it's a male or a female. So a female will typically have a, sort of a creamish color, and the males will typically have like a bluish color. And that will help determine which subpopulations within Gibraltar's coastline are actually source populations, or sink populations. The size distribution will also help. So if you, if you find, a, if you plot the size on a, uh, on a graph, for example, if it's skewed to the right, it's indicating that there's a, a larger number of, of reproductive females as opposed to males. If it's too skewed to the left, smaller specimens, which might indicate that collection is taking place or that simply the <coughs> recruits are not surviving. Another important element, which again, Clive touched upon very briefly in his presentation, is dispersal, which is related to connectivity. So far, most of the work that has been done on Patella ferruginea has essentially been on monitoring abundance and size distribution. Looking at the dispersal of larvae is at the moment considered the black box, not just for Patella ferruginea, but for a, a myriad of marine species. It's simply too difficult to, to study individual larvae because of the size. It presents um, difficulties when compared to seabirds, for example, where you can, you can plonk a, a geolocator or a GPS tag on its back. In the case of marine species, it, get, it gets much more difficult. Um, but the information from information on larval dispersal can be just as critical. In other words, if we know how far the larvae are reaching, we know where, for example, um, which areas need to be protected. Or we, also, we can also determine which areas the larvae are not reaching and therefore identify those as potential locations for translocations which have been carried out in Gibraltar before. Methods used to investigate larval dispersal are, are, are varied. Um, Keith mentioned genetics. That is certainly one of the, um, and probably the most common tool used to, to monitor dispersal. Having said that, the main drawback of, of that technique is that it tends to give you a sort of medium to long-term picture of connectivity or dispersal patterns. There are other techniques that are currently being employed, like for example, parentage analysis, um, where essentially you, you, you grab a, a bit of foot muscle tissue from a limpet um, and you build a catalog for different populations. The problem with that is that it's really intensive. Um, we also need to remember on ethical grounds, we're talking a, about a protect, protected species, so the, the likelihood of you killing a species when you're obtaining a sample is 
medium to high. So it's something which um, is definitely sort of not, not encouraged. Um, we need to look at other techniques to, to study dispersal. Um, one of them, for example, that has been used in other mollusks is geochemical fingerprinting. So looking at the shells of, of the limpets or, or, or other marine mollusks and seeing um, and analyzing the, the, the chemistry. Um, and the theory is that different areas within the Mediterranean will have a different chemical fingerprint and that will allow you to determine um, the area, the native area from where the, the animal originates. The one, the tool that has been used more widely um, is actually, um, are actually biophysical or hydrodynamic models. And there's one particular model that is applicable to the strait, which is called Sampatu. Um, it's a model that has been validated for actually for the use of monitoring chemical and oil spills in the Bay of Gibraltar. Um, the um, the Arasia's Port Authority actually have um, actually use it very frequently, um, and what I'm doing as part of of my research is essentially using that model to be able to determine the functional or the potential um, functional connectivity uh, of patella ferruginea. When, when looking at connectivity, there are different elements that you need to consider. The first one be is the structural connectivity. In other words, how is the habitat um, distributed in the study area? That will give you an indication of the, ha of, of, of the habitat mosaic. Secondly, there's the potential functional connectivity, which is what I'm trying to ascertain as part of my, my work. And I stress potential because it's different to realized connectivity, which is, for example, the type of data that you can obtain from GPS loggers. It's, it's, you're not making any inferences. So it's sort of the middle ground. <clears throat> Again, why is this information useful? Having an idea of larval dispersal or the dispersal kernel of Patella phylogenea will help determine which areas merit more protection. Now, when we talk about marine protected areas, the first thing that comes to mind might be you know, wider expanses, of, wide expanses of, of, of marine environments, like the southern waters, or even bigger. But that need not necessarily be the case. Small areas, like Sandy Bay, for example, um, which is actually uh, designated as a, as a no-fishing, no-take zone um, and included as part of the south, southern waters of Gibraltar can, is also an important area which merits protection. It can serve as a stepping stone for the limpet as part of its expansion. Not only the limpets, but what we're finding is that areas like, for example, Sandy Bay, which, have, which are composed of, of natural um, limestone, can also favor other species, like the spider crab, Magicic twinado, spotted sea bass, and the octopus species, which arguably might have more value for a fisherman, um, but it helps make the case when you want to sort of designate an area as an artificial marine microreserve, it's not just about the limpets which is sometimes difficult to communicate across, not only to the public, but also to the government. So when you start adding other species in the mix and make a correlation between the limpet and different species which might have a more utilitarian value for humans, it starts making the process of designation slightly easier. Again, when talking about <clears throat> artificial structures, it's not just about the limpet. There are other areas in Gibraltar, like the North Mole, for example, revetment, where we found species of Dendroporma species, which are essentially worm, worm snails. This is, um, it might not appear as a very charismatic species, but it's protected. Um, it formed really big bioconstructions, and it's an important habitat, particularly in, in um, areas in the, of the northwest Mediter Mediterranean. But it's good to know that we're finding them in, in, in artificial revetments because with time, it might be the case in the same way as the limpet 
is increasing, or the Patella ferruginea is increasing in numbers, it might be the case that other species um, will also take up this artificial habitat. Similarly, um, Lithophaga lithophaga, which is a, a, a boring mo mollusk. I'm not saying boring, boring in, this <laughs> in that sense, but it, it's also a, a species that we are finding in artificial revetments. I know Geraldine and Darren, for example, have found it in, in, as part of, the, of their surveys, and what we're finding now, as it was a part, as part of the work that I'm doing for my PhD, is that actually it, it might be more common than what we think. The fact that it burrows, it burrows into rock obviously makes it difficult to find, but it's certainly there, and it's worth noting that this species has quite a high level of protection too. What other species do we have in artificial structures? Well, we've also got another type of giant limpet, which is called Simbula safiana, which is that particular limpet on the left. This limpet is, is also quite picky in the same, uh, in the same way as, as, as Patella ferruginea. It likes gentle slopes. Um, so you won't find it in areas which have a lot of habitat complexity or barnacles. It likes flat slopes. Uh, an excellent place to find them in Gibraltar is actually the, the tetrapods in Little Bay. Um, there's a pretty decent number of, 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 of Simbola safiana there. Interestingly, there's hardly any, well, I haven't certainly found uh, any Patella ferruginea in that habitat, which goes to show that you really need to look at which materials you're using for coastal revetment very closely because it ha can have a knock-on effect on, on, on other species. Having said that, this species is also protected, high level of protection under the Barcelona Convention and also the Bern Convention. So just as important. And another species that we find in artificial um, littoral hab habitats and revetment is Lithophyllum bisoides. Again, it's an encrusting encrusting algae, which, is, um, which forms really important bioconstructions. Um, you tend to find these within the UNESCO World Heritage Site, actually, um, particularly on the northern side. There are some impressive um, bioconstructions of Lithophyllum bisoides. Again, another uh, protected habitat, and it's actually listed as a, a separate habitat in itself, something which we haven't studied um, or mapped yet, and, and certainly merits further consideration moving forward as part of the, the ongoing surveillance monitoring program. For a number of reasons, um, not just because of the fact that we have it here, but also because lithophyton bisoides can be used as an environmental indicator. Other species that we tend to find, or are finding, um, oysters, we think this is uh, Ostrea edulis, hasn't been confirmed yet. Hopefully we'll be taking some genetic samples uh, to be able to confirm it. But what we have certainly found is a very um, healthy population in the, in the airport. Um, there have also been observed in the, in the harbor area, in the new mid harbor. Um, but other than that, uh, they have not been seen in other parts of Gibraltar. Again, it shows how Restricted areas can also have an impact on, on which species you find. And it's not just about intertidal species. When protecting artificial or when setting up artificial marine micro reserves, you can also protect corals like Astroides calcicularis. Um, this particular species is quite common in Rosie Bay, for example, the revetments there. It's a good number of Astroides there. Um, it's also been found in the North Mole. Having said that, the numbers are, are, are quite scant. So, but, but still, it's there. It's actually considered as an environmental indicator because it likes clean water. Um, so certainly something to, to mention as part of the classification criteria when looking at what could be regarded as an artificial marine microreserve. It's not all good though. Unfortunately, since 2015, um, not only are artificial um, littoral habitats, but, but other habitats in Gibraltar have been significantly affected by the, the Asian seaweed. It was first reported 
in the Western Beach area. Well, that's where we started seeing um, quite big strandings of, of, of the seaweed, which coincided with similar strandings in Ceuta. Um, they were particularly hard hit. In fact, um, in, in some parts of Ceuta, there was nearly two meters of the seaweed in the beach where they actually had to close the beach off for part of the summer. Um, little did we know that the sea would, would progressively extend um, throughout the Straits region. And now we, found, well, we find ourselves in a pretty worrying situation, really, because the, the, the seabed in, in, the, in Gibraltar, I mean, uh, e even sandy habitats are being smothered by this invasive seaweed. And there's no sign that it's leaving. Um, there have been other occasions where similar proliferations have been recorded. In California, for example, um, they lasted approximately five to eight years, and then the numbers of, 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 of seaweed decreased. But well, I, I, I'm, I hope that is the case in the Straits region. I mean, the fact that there are very few natural predators, if any, I mean, we've only um, seen one particular species that's been feeding from the seaweed, which is um, uh, the Salema Poggi. Uh, but other than that, there are no other species which have taken a liking for it. And if you grab a bit of the seaweed and put it in your mouth, you will quickly find out why. Um, it's extremely bitter. Um, its chemical constituency is, is, is not nice. It's got, exactly, it's got turpines which, which make it unpalatable. So, to us. Um, to us, precisely, that's what I say. It's worrying, again, not only is it smothering the benthic, or well, benthic habitats in Gibraltar, it's also, it's also smothering intertidal habitats. This particular stand of Cystoseida species, which is generally regarded as the intertidal forest in parts of the Western Mediterranean, um, and associated with, with a sort of high species richness and, and, and diversity. This photo was taken in 2018, um, and it's the, one of the only locations in Gibraltar where this particular species is found. And this photo was taken this year. And what you find is the invasive seaweed is, is practically taking over the habitat. And areas in Rosa Bay, where there used to be a more decent amount of Cystoseida mediterranea are now completely covered in Rugulopteryx or Kumure, um, which is worrying. The use of novel underwater monitoring tools such as the underwater surveillance camera has helped actually monitor the spread of the seaweed. I mean, uh, we actually saw it coming. Um, when some trials were carried out with seagrass restoration, um, the seaweed started growing in the vicinity. It completely covered the camera uh, and required literally weekly dives to clean it up after the wiper broke down. Um, but I thought it would be useful to include this slide because the camera, aside from the invasive seaweed, it's also proving, use, proving useful to monitor other invasive species which are creeping into our shores. Um, we've seen, for example, the blue-spotted cornet fish, um, Fistulara, Fistularia comensoni, spotted uh, using the, the underwater camera. And it's definitely, a, 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 in my opinion, opinion certainly an, an underutilized um, scientific tool that can be used for, for carrying out uh, censuses, which I know Darren is currently contemplating using it as part of research. Um, and it can certainly be used to monitor the spread of invasive species. The next one that will likely make its way here could be the limefish. There are other tools which, believe it or not, are useful when it comes to monitoring invasive species. Um, one of them, for example, um, is um, Facebook. Um, the excellent work done by Luis Tagnieto and, and his, his citizen science platform, the Nemo app, that's managed to pluck up of a number of invasive species um, that are creeping into our waters. Uh, and also Facebook groups like the Gibraltar Marine Biodiversity Project. So this one, this photo actually was, was interesting because um, up until um, recently, the numbers of the invasive seaweed 
were generally restricted to around 30 meters in depth. Um, and along came one of the divers from, from GSAC, who, who's a regular contributor to the Gibraltar Marine Biodiversity Project, and he actually found um, the invasive down at 65 meters in, of depth. It's pretty dark down there, as you can see, um, and it sort of boggled some of the researchers that are currently working in, in, in the field. Um, but again, it goes to show that you know, social media can actually be an extremely useful tool for surveillance monitoring. Moving on then, um, I'm wearing my Department of the Environment hat. I mean, uh, we've talked a bit about pelagic species, um, and I think it's fair to say that since, since 2014, the amount of surveillance that's carried out in our waters has increased considerably, particularly since the Environmental Protection and Research Unit was created. Um, since 2014, they've practically been out there every day um, collecting useful information on, on, on sightings of different types of, of, of megafauna, um, but also on different types of fish from recreational fisheries and even um, illegal commercial fisheries as well. Um, and they've played a they are playing a crucial enforcement role today. They, and, and, and I think it's worth mentioning that point because another, another uh, interesting element that I have found in, in, in the work I've done is that there might be a, 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 an increased number of marine protected areas designated in the Western Mediterranean, but not all of them have an enforcement body that's actually there every day, which is one of the reasons why they're frequently sort of criticized as being paper parks. Without enforcement, it's, 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 it's difficult, um, really, for you to be able to, to really um, protect uh, uh, an area and, and, and give it the, the designation that it, that it merits. So some of the work that we've been doing in terms of pelagic habitats has, has, has focused on, on marine mammals. Since 2017, we've, we've set up a, a joint surveillance, surveillance project between the EPRU and researchers from the Marine Mammal Information Research and, and Conservation Group. Rocio Spada, in particular, has been um, the lead researcher there. Um, and the results to date have been extremely useful. If you bear in mind that before that, although there is some information or there is some data on on dolphins, etc., for the bay, um, it was quite dated, and most of the information available was um, largely corresponded to the more western part of, of the Strait of Gibraltar. These are just some photos of the ongoing catalogue. It's been updated as, as we speak, so um, we've got um, data going up to 2018, and now we're working on the 2018 to 2020 tranche. And we've managed to catalogue you know, different species, like the common dolphin, for example, striped dolphin, fin whales, and sperm whales. This particular animal was actually, um, we shared the, these photos with, with um, another um, researcher that's working in the Alboran and also in the Eastern Mediterranean, and we managed to make uh, a match. This animal in particular had been traced back to uh, 1998. It's been using the Straits of Gibraltar um, as a feeding ground for well over um, 20 years. It's called Animaita. <laughs> um, and it's one of, the, of a num one of a number of sperm whales that used the Straits of Gibraltar. But interestingly, these whales are not moving out into the Atlantic. They're actually going into the, into the Mediterranean. Um, this is some of the summary data. Again, it needs to be updated. It's up to 2018. But you can already see that in terms of numbers, we are managing to compile quite a decent data set, 344 individuals up until 2018. Um, 2020 in particular has been an excellent year for the fin whale 
um, and we've counted over 50 animals using um, the Gibraltar Marine Reserve. Out of those 50, we've managed to obtain at least another 10 um, photos, good quality photos of dorsal fins, which will help add to the, um, the ongoing catalog, which we will be using to compare with the animals that uh, currently use the Pelagios Sanctuary in the northwest of the Mediterranean. So hopefully we'll be able to make some interesting matches there moving forward. We're also employing new techniques when it comes to carrying out surveys, such as drones. Um, and this is proving to, to be extremely useful in terms of not just for monitoring the abundance of, of, of cetaceans, as you can see from here. It facilitates actually counting the, the individuals. And unfortunately, um, my minister uh, hasn't been able to, to present today, and, and he was going to show you some really interesting images of social, social interactions of, of different dolphin pods. And it's something which we certainly haven't seen in the bay before, or at least studied. Um, when we carry out the um, photo ID surveys, we, we also collect da data on dolphin behavior. And using the drone has been able to help us sort of characterize the type of behavior that the animals are actually doing. In other words, is it feeding? Is it milling? Um, are they just socializing? Um, the drone has been extremely useful in, in that regard. In terms of some data collected so far, some interesting patterns coming out uh, with regards to the different species. Common dolphin, given its feeding nature, much more pelagic, um, so a more generalized distribution. The striped dolphin, however, um, likes to feed in deeper areas. And interestingly, most of the sightings are being recorded within the submarine canyon in the middle of the bay. Another interesting um, finding so far uh, relates to the bottlenose dolphin and the fact that it actually likes to move close to the coastline, particularly artificial coastal structures, which is in interesting from an artificial marine micro-reserve perspective. We haven't seen it feeding on octopus, but we suspect that that is one of the reasons why it's moving closer inshore. Um, in terms of fin whales, um, again, some very interesting data coming out. Um, on the left-hand side, um, you can see a heat map, essentially, of, of, of the data collected from two different sources. And it's important to make a distinction between the two. One of them is the opportunistic surveys that we carry out. We try and go out every month, unfortunately. Uh, sometimes it's not possible. But also um, adding um, data from the citizen science program. Uh, and what we're finding is, A, that the animals are literally hugging the coast. And two, um, going back to, to Clive's presentation area uh, earlier, they're migrating and they're, they're just moving through. There has been no evidence of them feeding whilst transiting through our waters so far. It would be interesting if we were able to record fin whales feeding in the area for a number of reasons. But so far, it's pretty clear that they're sticking towards um, the coastline. They're doing so as they're coming down from the northwest Mediterranean, waiting for the right conditions in tide sometimes even circling on the east side, a bit like your BA flight from Heathrow. <laughs> and when the conditions are right, it will go straight out. And we've actually seen that during our surveys. We've actually seen the whales circling near, near tankers. And then when the conditions have changed, tides going out, they'll go out too. With the loggerhead turtle, um, it presents a different picture. It, 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 it seems to show that the turtles are, are actually foraging in our waters. And that would co coincide with the data that's been collected so far in Ceuta, where the animals are actually seen feeding in the area and they stay in the area for a number of days, um, as opposed to just migrating through. 
And there were two particular prey items that they tend to have a liking for in the Straits of Gibraltar region. One of them is a species of crab, and the other one is jellyfish. Again, early days still. We only started collecting data in 2017. Um, I'm sure in the next five or 10 years, even more patterns will, will begin to, to come out. There is also um, the possibility, given the fact that Gibraltar, or that the fin whales in particular, are moving or migrating so closely um, to our coastline, it could be the case that Gibraltar is a good springboard or platform for um, putting tags on fin whales and ascertaining exactly wh where, where they're going um, or where their wintering grounds are. We sus well, the literature indicates that they are moving into the Northeast Atlantic, particularly off the coast of Co um, Portugal, Bay of Biscay, that area. But data on the, on the subject are, are scarce at the moment. Something to consider, no doubt, moving forward. One particular habitat where there is generally a lack of information is certainly the deep sea environment. To, in fact, to date, there is hardly any data collected aside from the habitat mapping exercise that was carried out, um, I believe in 2012, there hasn't been any other um, detailed um, survey carried out of the deep sea environment found in Gibraltar. And we do have two particular types of deep sea, deep sea habitats which, which are of relevance. One of them is the submarine canyon, which is found on the left-hand side. There are actually two submarine canyons found, one inside the bay and one just northeast of Gibraltar which is called the La Linea Canyon, um, which sort of joins with the coastal shelf break found in, in our waters. Most of the information that we have on the deep sea ecosystem is largely reliant on um, accidental catch, like this particular animal, Edmopterox spinax, the velvet belly lantern shark, and also Chaulodia species, your viperfish. Now these species you tend to find in depths of up to 1,000, 2,000 meters. Um, there is also anecdotal evidence from, um, from the fishing sector that sharks like, for example, the blunt-nosed six-gilled shark is found in, in Gibraltar's deep sea environment. However, we have not been able to find or, or to prove it to date. It's very likely though that it's, that it's there. If you look at the habitat down there, it certainly, um, it certainly merits further exploration. Um, this, I, I, I've included two, two um, different angles from one area in particular, which, which I find quite interesting for a number of reasons. Um, the top of that sort of dark area, the depth there is around 200 meters, and at the bottom, it's approximately 700. So we're looking at more or less the heights of the rock of Gibraltar um, below the surface, a submerged cliff face in our waters. I think most, and a lot of people are, are not aware that we have that particular habitat here. Um, this one obviously it is taken from a southeast angle, and this one is taken from a southwest angle. Um, it's certainly a habitat that merits further exploration using tools like an ROV, for example. And I'm pretty sure that it will be useful not just from a habitat classification or ecological perspective, but also from an archaeological and heritage perspective. I mean, who knows what's, what's down there? I mean, we're talking about a depth of 200 to 700 meters. And interestingly, nobody's ever been down there. And what could we find? Well. There are a number of species that we could be finding there, aside from viper fish, six-gilled blunt-nosed shark, um, and velvet belly lantern sharks. Cold water corals, for example, like this specimen, Dendrophilia cornigera. Um, these are the types of species that we could be finding there. And I think it's important to raise this because, again, cold water coral is a habitat in itself. And it's very likely that we have 
more significant stands of cold water coral in our waters. I mean, if you look at that particular slope, that is considered ideal conditions for cold water corals. You've got nutrient-rich waters, you've got the depth there, you've got the perfect slope and the perfect substrate for those particular types of, of, of habitat. However, we haven't been able to explore it yet. What other types of corals could we be finding there? Well, there's been a lot of research carried out in the Western Mediterranean on other cold water corals, like, for example, white corals, um, Lophelia epertuosa, Madrepora species, and also black corals. It's very likely that these um, corals are also found in our waters. It would be a huge find from a representativity or, or habitat characterization perspective. It's certainly something which would work very well for the um, Gibraltar Marine Reserve in terms of highlighting its importance. Aside from limpets, um, it would be extremely beneficial to be able to say that we have cold water corals, which we do, but at least larger stands in our waters. And I hope that that is something that moving forward in future, we'll be able to, to carry out. So looking towards the horizon, um, there is certainly the opportunity, hopefully post COVID, when funding streams become available, to be able to get down there and see exactly what we have in Gibraltar's deep sea environment, which at the moment is arguably our Achilles heel. And with that, I reach the end of my presentation. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Stephen, for that very interesting talk. Do we have questions from the floor? Can I ask, uh, I'm going to ask one question, Stephen. We, uh, during the first day, we were discussing, one of the things we discussed was the um, collection of material and the constitution of reference collections, essentially, for species in Gibraltar. Um, we didn't go into it in, in great detail, but my question to you is, as a researcher and working in a department where you're going to need to have relatively accurate, or I would say very accurate, um, identification of species, is there a move to uh, begin to put together a reference collection at least of the m more difficult species? Uh, we, we've started moving in that direction. Um, so we do, we do compile lists of, of, of species that we find, like for example, um, I, I mentioned these these two species in particular, but there have been other species that we've, we've found, like the kite fin shark, for example, which is another species of shark that you find in, 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 in deep water. So we, we have started compiling a list. We do have a, a, a network of um, regional researchers, which have, has been facilitated by means of, of Darren. So we do tend to talk to each other um, when we find something which is um, of, of relevance. But having said that, I think I would I would agree with you that I think it, it certainly needs um, more thought, um, particularly when it comes to sharing that data set in the same way that we're sharing a photo ID catalog with other catalogs that are being developed in the Western Mediterranean and in the Northeast Atlantic. It's certainly something that merits further consideration and, 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 so, and making sure that whatever data we collect is being collected in a manner that would be useful for other researchers working in, in in that particular field. Right. I, I agree with that, and that's uh, perhaps something that I would expect a lot of researchers to do anyway. But my, my question was mainly, or was, it was focused on the collection of specimens themselves, so that you're able to go back to a particular specimen, especially with some that may be very difficult to acquire anyway. Say, for example, if there were deep sea and, and so on and so forth. So forth. Uh, is, there a, uh, is there a move to collect or not necessarily sp specifically go out and collect? If any were to come your way, would you have them as voucher specimens and so on for future research and in order to be able to match them to further specimens that come your way in the future? We have the facilities, so I, I would say yes. We have the facilities in place that we, as part of the work done by the EPRU. Um, uh, 
we, we tend to collect stranded animals of dolphins, log eye turtles, um, and, and sometimes even fish, which if, if, there's, if there's been, like, for example, earlier on this year, um, the, we, we found hundreds of one particular, well, uh, two particular types of species stranded on Eastern Beach, and we, we collected animals and we, we, we held them in storage um, for, for, for analysis. So, so yes, I mean, in answer to your question, Alex, that's certainly something that we should be doing moving forward. And we certainly have the capability and the facilities locally to do that. Okay, thank you. Keith, Ben Susan. Yeah, and Alex, just a, just a comment uh, to follow on from your question is that uh, the, the, bot the botanic gardens are in, in the process of uh, planning a, a marine algae herbarium together with colleagues in Malaga and Granada universities. It's just a shame that we didn't begin to do so before Rugalopteryx arrived because we, we would have known what the, what the baseline yes. was. Mm. Which in, it, in itself indicates how important collections can be, yeah. even in the, very short, in the very short time frame, because if there had been a collection going back 10, 15 years or so, uh, you would have been able to have seen that change within the material that was there at the time and that you would be able to collect now. So that, I think, adds to what we were talking about the other day, about the value of continual collection. I'm not talking about collecting material for the sake of it. I'm talking about for research collection. So that you have a, a sufficiently comprehensive, almost... Uh, time series of certain species. I'm not necessarily saying that we, this should be considered for an endangered species and so on, but material can come your way without it having to necessarily have to have been collected specifically. I mean, things wash up on the, on the beach all the time, for example. And you, if you are uh, uh, doing marine work, and Darren certainly will have certainly during the period of time have found what can be relatively rare um, uh, species, not necessarily rare per se, but because you're not able to acquire them easily. So to go back to, to, to what we were discussing, by having had that short-term collection or um, serialised collection, you would have had that information, which is one of the things we were talking about, if you remember, Geraldine, about having a collection of skin material, bird skin material in Tring and the Smithsonian is the other, is probably the, the largest collection in the world of this, the Smithsonian followed by Tring. Um, very, very few specimens are collected nowadays, so you would, you've lost, you actually have a, a hiatus of almost 100, 150 years of material that is, is I'm not advocating collecting material, I'm just saying that uh, by Keith having raised that, that I think yeah. uh, adds justification in following all ethical procedures and everything else to ensure that there is material that you can actually work with. Yeah. I think two, two points arising from that. The first is that the, the building of a, of a collection is, is often, or I would say actually invariably, a catalyst for, for, the, for the attainment of knowledge. As a result of building a, re a reference connect collection, you become more knowledgeable mm -hmm. on, on those species. But the, if, if, if we're going to talk about birds um, and, and uh, the collection of skins or, or otherwise, um, I mean, nowadays we, c we, we are continuing to collect a lot of knowledge on birds without having to collect skins. I mean, by visual observation, by photography and so forth. So I don't think collections are necessary in that sense. But there are different taxa that would uh, uh, merit or not. If you were, for example, to be studying a sea uh, spiders and yeah. sea scorpions, that group, you would need material. There's no course, other yeah. way you could. Yeah. So yeah. various from time to time. Sorry, Alex, uh, sorry Jeremy. Order, um, okay. can, just point of order, can we not stick to the questions? Yes, the sorry, we've, we've turned lecture. this into a discussion. And, yes, and yes, yes. the discussion for yeah, the yeah, later okay. session, please, because otherwise uh, it's just... Yes, it's not fair yes. on Stephen. No, no, it's true. It's, uh, it's, it's, it's uh, <laughs> apologies as chair for that. We just got carried away. Right, so I'll collect my thoughts. Uh, so any more questions for Stephen on his... Um, Rian Gujem? Yeah, um, a last question is probably... We, you're not going to know the answer to, but anyway, um, what, can we do, what can be done about Rugalopteryx? Uh, 
or do we just let it completely smother everything? At some stage, you're going to have to really s start doing something about it. And do you know of anyone who is currently looking into this? I, I, I do know somebody who's, who's, who's working specifically on, on A, what can be done, and also what to do with it. Um, at the moment, most of... Well, it's actually the University of Seville, uh, Marine Biology um, Division is, is actually working in, in the strait, um, looking at what, what can be done due to obvious reasons or in terms of impact. I mean, this year in particular, I think they've been doing some work on, on the impacts of Rugolopteryx on the um, nets that are used to catch Atlantic bluefin tuna of Tarifa. Um, and that has particularly raised a lot of eyebrows given the commercial importance of that particular sector. Um, but going back to your question, Rian, um, I think the work that is currently being done is following two particular strands. The first one is what to do with all those massive, all that biomass. Um, there's some work being carried out in terms of using the material for cosmetics at the moment, yeah. Um, particularly defoliating and um, ex uh, exfoliating creams. <laughs> but if, yeah. it, if it contains these, what, turpentine, you said? Turpines. Turpines. Yeah. Isn't that... Well, if, how can you put that on the skin, <laughs> really? That, that, that's, that's what, the, that's what um, they're currently looking into. And also, and also yeah, they're looking at... Um, um, sorry? Potential medical. Potential, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, potential. Um, what can we do with it? The honest answer is, I don't know. Um, I don't think anyone knows at the moment what can be done. Um, they've carried out a couple of sort of, um, of, uh, sort of exercises which have been off the cuff in terms of trying to use nets to collect the seaweed, but those have proved yeah, useless. How does that load thing anyway? Exactly. Well, it's, it's, the, the thing is, I mean, the, the one thing about the marine sphere is that you can't, you can't seal it off. You can't, you can't hedge it in. You can't... Uh, uh, and this kind of stuff, literally, a bit breaks off, it'll fall to the seabed and it'll start growing again. Um, it's a bit like the, the Calerpa tax, which is coming in the other direction from Monaco. And we're getting a lot of issues with, with invasives, but yeah. The, the diff uh, and you don't want to bring in a predator from somewhere else, because usually mm. when they've done that, the predator finds that the local stuff is much nicer because it's not been not adapted to, so, so, it'll, so it, it doesn't work. So you really, there's not much you can do, unfortunately. No. Uh, uh, Caroline and, and Finlayson, sorry. Uh, first of all, uh, ca carry on with your response. Steve. Well, I mean, well, one, one particular point that should be mentioned in relation to the seaweed is that at the, at the moment, it's restricted to the Straits of Gibraltar. So it's landed here, and it's taken a liking for the particular um, sort of environmental conditions which are, which are found in the Straits. And that is um, sort of corroborated by the existing distribution, which it goes all the way up to the area of um, Bologna, bit further, bit further up, and on the eastern side, past Estepona, Malaga. And it, it's, it's largely restricted to that area at the moment. Interesting times ahead um, to see whether it actually moves further out or whether it's the particular environmental conditions found in the Straits which are better suited for the Rugolopteryx. And that might give an indication as to you know, what might be the exact reasons why it's proliferated in the first place. <clears throat> Sorry, my question was, uh, do you have any systematic, I'm coming away from the seaweed now, uh, but do you have any systematic um, observations being taken you know, at certain intervals, always at the same place to see how things are changing? Or at the moment, are you still on the sort of early stages of just monitoring and, and uh, recording what you have here? We, we, we've got two, or we had two, should I say. Um, over the past two years, we were installing quadrats in different um, subtitle habitats in Gibraltar. We had a quadrat in El Cortijo Reef, and we had another cod rat um, in Parsons Lodge. Unfortunately, those were um, taken away by, by way of exposure, um, which was a pity because um, the quad, there were also similar cod rats or sentinel stations, uh, as they are being called, in the Tarifa area. Particularly, um, or, or more geared towards looking at the, um, 
the, po the population of Astroides carciculares, which is a sensitive species for, for a number of reasons. So um, we had those for two years. Um, obviously, the data collected was, was, was poor. What we do have, though, are photos taken with the underwater camera, which is precisely the reason why I, I, I thought it would be useful to include in the presentation, because we have photos going back to when the camera was first installed up to now, which is at least five years now, which show how um, the, uh, the invasive algae has actually taken over some um, faces or, or bits of intertidal, sorry, subtidal rock in the Seven Sisters area. Um, so yeah, we do take snapshots quite regularly, um, and it's a, what we do need to do. What, what we do need to do, though, Geraldine, is perhaps um, have a more systematic process in place and have an, a researcher specifically working on it, not just to monitor invasives, but also species of fish, for example, in terms of surveys, etc. I, I wasn't talking specifically of the, of the, the weed. I was talking generally of, of all the species, not just fish, not just um, algae, um, just general monitoring and regular monitoring rather than observational, you know, yeah. sort of. Um, and the other question I wanted to ask was uh, related. Do you, I know that you sample water, I know that, yeah. uh, but do you do, you do um, water column samples on a regular basis as well? We used to do, we used to collect water column samples up until uh, 2015. Um, I know there are other researchers that are collecting samples in, in the water column and it's something that we're going to restart again. But up until 2015, we were collecting um, samples on physical chemical parameters, so temperature, salinity, dissolved oxygen, and also on, on phytoplankton. Um, that stopped for a period and it's something that we're now going to kickstart again. We want to tie it in with the monitoring for deep sea environments um, because, as I said before, th there's no data um, below the um, 40 meter uh, isobath we don't have any, any data, at least as a department. Yeah. We know that it's being collected as yeah. part of other PhD other projects. projects. Yeah. yeah, and it's something that we're, we're working. Um, it just seems to me that because you're a department, you've got opportunities to start setting up these observations as baseline data, yeah. which then researchers who come and go necessarily yeah. because of funding and yeah. other projects can then draw on. Yeah. Um, it, it, the it, same it, goes for the observational. Then yeah, it, it, it's a pity that the Sentinel stations that were um, that we're, we were using uh, disappeared, um, but they are going to be installed again. Uh, obviously, we will see the, the, the fruits of our labor in five, ten years' time, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which is exactly what is being done now in, in, in Tarifa, for example, where they've got a network, of, a network of sentinel stations using those fixed quadrats mm -hmm. um, at different depths, and that is something that we are yeah. hoping to have here in place Very soon. Very interesting. Yeah. Who knows, maybe we could do it some, in conjunction with the... Well, maybe we could, because we're yeah, doing that kind of monitoring in the World Heritage site, we're doing above water, we're doing that, so it would be useful to combine them. Yeah. And just to have them as a baseline, not necessarily to have them as part of a, a research project, but just to have it as data. Yeah. A little bit, what you were saying, yeah. rather than collecting the individuals, collecting just the data and taking photographs yeah. and all that, and, you know, it builds up the database. Yeah. yeah, because that's all it takes, really. It's yeah. a, a, taking a photo of the Absolutely. quadrats and, and then obviously using... I mean, obviously you need the human in, in, yeah. uh, input, but that would be very interesting data, and then as years go by, you'd, you'd have that as a baseline. Yeah. Okay, thanks. Okay. Thank you very much, Stephen. Excellent. Thank you. Okay.